Good afternoon, everyone. The time is sharp, 2.30 now. We shall start our session today. Welcome to our session on the fundamentals of organizing and writing academic research papers. So we have been in this session over the last many weeks now. So I hope uh, for those of you who have missed any of the session, you are able to follow our session, our recorded session. If you think that you do not have the links, please do not have uh, any hesitation to, to contact us. So remember this session is recorded and uh, please mute yourself. And uh, if you need to ask question, you can post it in the chat throughout the session, or you can even unmute yourself or raise your hand and then uh, ask the question. Um, so this session, as you are aware, uh, is the fundamentals on how to write good research papers. Uh, it is designed for everyone. It's not just for staff and students, but anyone who wants to learn how to write a good academic research paper. So we are being very broad in, in some of the areas that we are discussing today. So today we are in our lesson number six. The focus is on methodology. Over the past five uh, sessions, we have already done on how to choose a good topic, preparing to write, writing the abstract and introduction. In our last session, we focus on literature review. And today we're going to look at another important uh, part of the study, which is methodology. How do you write good research methodology? So as usual, uh, three of us will take uh, the three different areas to present uh, the discussion today. Uh, Prof. Brian Embry, uh, who is the CEO and of District College and also a adjunct professor at Wawasan Open University will handle the, the first part of the discussion. And then I'll take over uh, uh, the second part. And then we also have our chief librarian, uh, Ms. Fairo Nizan, to, to discuss on the library support uh, in terms of resources that is available that can help you to write a good uh, research methodology. So what we're gonna be covering today uh, is the list that you see on the screen here definition of methodology, how do you group the research methodology, and how to write an effective methodology section. And then uh, followed by me, I will take into, I will go deep inside on uh, talking, on discussing how do you design a good quantitative research method and qualitative research method, and how do you, what are the important things that you need to take notice of. So we will be doing a bit broad, so we are not going to be talking the detail of, of, of quantitative research, qualitative research, because this class is not on, on that, not so much focus on the method, but more on how to write a good research methodology chapter. And then the last part, uh, Ms. Fairunisa will handle on the library support. So now I shall hand over the session to Prof. Brian to give you a good uh, overview of this uh, research methodology chapter, and also to talk about you a little on the philosophy of, of, of research. Over to you, Prof. Brian. Brian, you are muted. Uh, thank you, Prof. Vic. Uh, I just want to reiterate the section I'm about to go through, which is quite theoretical in nature. We'll provide the main theoretical structures for you. And, uh, but it, um, it would require more reading if you're doing a higher level of research. Um, just the other day, Prof Vic and I were talking with uh, actually the Vice Chancellor from Health University and talking about how important it is that researchers understand why they're using a particular method. Uh, and so, we, so we, and that needs to come through in different ways in terms of your write up, depending on what you're actually writing. Okay, if you're doing a, um, a research paper, um, you don't need to unpack so much the philosophy of science, but if you are at the other extreme doing a PhD, a doctor of, of doctorate of philosophy, you would need to have in more depth. So we'll only skip, skim across the top today, All right? First of all, defining methodology. The method section of a research paper provides the information by which a study's validity is judged. And this word validity, you may have seen, in plain English, really, it means the extent a method measures what it intends to measure, right? Another word that consistently comes up is reliability. Reliability. So, so it, it's, a, it's the consistency of the, of, the, uh, of the measure. 
all right? Um, the methods section really answers uh, two main questions, all right? And notably, the, the first is in the past tense. How was the data collected or generated in your study? And then looking forward to the next section, how will it be analyzed? And the, and the, and the rationale why a particular method or methods have been chosen to analyze the data. The writing should be direct, precise, and written because you're, it's meant to be an application of scientific method. And we'll talk more about scientific method in a few slides. Uh, next slide. It's important to have a, a good methodology so the reader uh, knows how the data was obtained, right? Um, was it a, a reliable um, data collection method? Was it a reliable uh, um, uh, basis in the context of research which has previously been done? and based upon the, the theory of, of appropriate research, um, yeah, to, to ensure that um, it's able to be replicated uh, to confirm the validity of the results. Now, that's not always possible to, to, to actually replicate a piece of research, but we will, um, but if we're talking about a survey, all right, or, um, which is what we call a more positive type of research, um, uh, generally speaking, it should be uh, uh, able to be replicated. Uh, good methodology and it needs to make clear the reasons why you chose that method or methods and the, uh, the data um, and you need to indicate the data was collected in a, in a manner um, that is consistent with accepted general practice. All right. Having said that, Methodology should not be paint by numbers, right? So uh, you shouldn't simply say, this is how all research is done. This is the only way to do research. We need as researchers to be open-minded to different perspectives and be continually learning and evolving in our methodological practice. Okay, so, so if you look at this, um, I want an example about consistent um, accepted practice is you need, needs to be consideration, was the sample large enough to make generalizable concluding? Now, the size of a sample is somewhat, of a, for example, a judgment call, depending on how big is the, the sample potential, sample population, and what other research has been done in the field. Another aspect of good methodology is to ensure it's appropriate, appropriate to the objectives of the study. A, a, a thing I often like to ask students uh, who I'm supervising, be it for their undergraduate or postgraduate research, uh, when selecting method, are you asking what questions or why questions? If you're asking why questions, you're actually going deeper and you and may want to uh, uh, use methods uh, more on interviews and, uh, and uh, focus groups and so on. Um, which is what we call qualitative method. But if you're asking what questions, it's more likely to, to be towards, but not only, okay, um, positivist or, or questionnaire type of uh, survey results, uh, uh, method. Um, good method uh, in terms of write-up should discuss the problems that were anticipated and the steps that you took to overcome them. You, very rarely do you have smooth sailing in terms of execution of your research, okay? And you need to be somewhat transparent and tell the real story. Do not fall into the, uh, you know, the, the error of just glossing over and pretending everything is right, okay? Um, it needs to be an honest um, report of what actually occurred. And it needs to provide, as I said, sufficient information where possible to allow others to replicate. Next slide. I've already touched upon some of these, even as I was discussing on the previous uh, slide, but an effectively written methodology, method, methodological section um, uh, needs to introduce the overall method, methodological approach. And um, so there's a qualitative or a quantitative or a combination of of, of both, which is called a mixed method. A mixed method, for example, may be that you go out and, you, and you're testing a model, 
all right? I come from more from a, a social science perspective, testing an existing model quantitatively, so using maybe questionnaires, and then you, you get an unusual result and you want to know why. So this goes back to the what and the why. The why is, pro, is usually better answered through qualitative research. So doing interviews or focus groups where you, you can unpack various reasons why that result occurred, okay? Uh, an effectively written met a method section would indicate um, how the approach fits within the overall research design. Um, and uh, so, so does the method actually address the objectives of the research problem at hand? Um, all right, so it's, it's what versus why. Um, it, it should describe the specific methods of the data collection you use. So was it, um, was it uh, surveys, interviews, questionnaires, observation? Um, there's something even called snowball sampling, all right? So we ask one person, we ask another person, and uh, you know, there, and again, that needs to be considered, is this a norm within this field of research? And how do you justify that selection? It needs to explain how you intend to analyze your results in the next section, okay? Is it gonna be statistical analysis? Is it going to be some a content analysis of using qualitative research? Um, what type of tools are you gonna to use to aid in that analysis? Okay, it needs to provide a background rationale for the for the uh, for the methodologies. Okay, that, that are being used, um, and and also provide uh, a rationale for the selection and sa sampling method behind it. It needs to address any potential limitations which are well known and established. Okay, and, and you would reference that in your write up. All right. Um, or indeed any any limitations that, which which were came from the sampling uh, method maybe found it difficult to get a fully balanced sample and you need to report on that. Uh, the description on uh, lastly it should description on how you prepared to study the research problem, um, how you gather data uh, needs to be all organized in a chronological order. All right, so it's easy for the reader to understand the process. Take note, however, don't um, uh, provide any background information that, that, that doesn't help the reader to understand what's at hand. It's very easy uh, if you're doing some research to unload, be tempted to unload your whole story. You've got to re step back and look from the reader's perspective, what do they need to know? And don't put in things which distract the reader. Don't do, I see this particularly happening with undergraduate research, but also sometimes creeping into master's write-ups where there's a, a, a extensive rationale provided why a particular method is used. And a, you know, why, I've even seen it at this level, why multiple regression is used, all right? Which is such an, a basic and accepted method or why PLS is used, all right? Um, more extensive write-up of applied method is only really required when it's something new in that field of study. Very rarely you need to go into very basic procedures, right? You need to say at a higher level why you select the method, but unpacking the very detail is not necessary. Um, let me find my notes. Okay. Uh, problem blindness. Uh, you need to document how you overcome any obstacles you came across, and you and sources need to be cited uh, on why you chose a particular method. Next slide. I want to just talk about, and there's a lot of words on the slide. We're not going to talk through them, all right? Philosophy of science is really I mean, well. First of all, don't be scared by the word philosophy. It's just pondering or thinking and perspective gains on how we learn about knowledge, right? You see in the top right here, this word ontology. Ontology is um, really our worldview, if you like, of what is real, right? Epistemology is how we learn about what is real, 
all right? A, a theory of how we learn about what's real. And methodology are the techniques which together we apply to learn about what is real, all right? If you look at, um, uh, if you look down the slide, you'll see there's three different categories of, of research. In reality, there's far more, but there's um, the simplified here for you, ranging from positivism to interpretivism at the, at, at the other extreme. And in between there is sandwich critical realism. Um, positives believe re reality is stable and can be observed, measured, and, ob and objectively reported upon. Okay, so you, you, um, they would more likely use, um, you know, a survey type instrument to understand something, right? And they would use words such as prove, all right? Although I am somewhat skeptical in terms of my particular philosophy of any researcher using the word proof, all right? Um, at the other end, interpreters um, argue um, that only through subjectivity, so not objectivity, but subjectively, the, the researcher interpreting and sometimes being involved in collecting the, uh, with the, with the uh, respondent and collecting the data, then we can we actually understand something. In, if you're in social science and behavioral research, which I know many of you are, all right, you should consider um, stepping away and not, at least not confining yourself solely to positivist research, all right? Uh, if you want to understand why things are happening and build new models, okay, you need to uh, think about either critical realism we're about to touch on or interpretism. Critical realism is an approach where things are perceived to be in existence, whether or not someone's actually thinking about them. So whereas interpretism is where you actually, it's a real life data collection and the truth is being, is, is uh, fluid and alive, right? A, a critical realism may include, for example, going back and looking at human behavior historically. So looking at archive documents, but there are other, other, other approaches in terms of how it's applied as well. So if you look at the, at the top right, our belief and, and our own personal beliefs and assumptions will derive our research philosophies and our research philosophies also change us as individuals. And both of these inform our research design. For me personally, my journey in terms of scientific research philosophy um, was something uh, I only came across when I was doing my, my PhD in New Zealand and was one of those awakening moments. I encourage you to begin to think about and read wi uh, widely about why we use particular types of research. I, if you want to come and talk with Prof Vic or I, I know that we'd welcome those discussions and point you in the right direction on some books. Uh, next slide. Just building on the previous slide, um, this is perhaps a, a, a simple way of, of you actually understanding further the difference between positivism at one end and interpretism at the other, right? If you look at the first section, okay, where we examine the relationship between society and the individual. Please excuse me for reading, but I think it's, it is clearly stated. So, um, for positivism, society shapes the individual. Society and society is seen to consist of social facts, so things that can be fully apprehended, okay? Um, uh, and people's actions can generally be explained by the social norms within which they, you know, the context within which they're in. On the other side, uh, interpretism is seen where individuals have consciousness and, and are not just puppets, right? They're fluid, so I'm talking about before. They have their own ability to act, act outside the norm. Um, rather than simply follow the social forces. Uh, and it, it's basically coming from a perspective uh, that we are complex individuals. If you, if you look at the general focus of social research, the point of research is to uncover laws, whereas interpretism, so build models and laws, okay, um, whereas interpretism, the point is to gain in-depth understanding about the lives of respondents, okay? And, and so 
So in terms of positivism, you tend to use more quantitative research, all right? So that's number crunching, all right? Okay, whereas interpretism, we, we tend to use uh, more uh, qualitative research for more word-based recovery research, all right? Um, if we look at the issues of validity and reliability, which I touched on at the beginning of my, my presentation today, quantitative research requires research to be valid, reliable, and representative of that particular sample population. Whereas qualitative doesn't claim to fully apprehend, right? It acknowledges that people are complex and we, we're only marching towards a, a, a better understanding. And therefore, qualitative researchers acknowledge um, that uh, they need to uh, sacrifice um, reliability somewhat in the greater interest of validity. Hope you understand that. If not, come and share with us. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so, uh, so we have here two perspectives. All right. So quantitative is more objective. Qualitative is more subjective. Objective being independent, right? Subjective is that people are not puppets. All right. Quantitative is deductive. So this plus this equals something else. A plus B equals C, right? Um, so you can arrive at a truth. Where, whereas qualitative is more subjective, saying, hey, okay, it depends on the individual, but generally speaking, you find this, all right? Quali quantitative is generalizable, all right? You, you find a, a law, a truth, and you can generalize it to the whole population. Qualitative is uh, whereby you uh, find something which of use and we begin to understand, but we fully not it never fully apprehend. Okay. Quantitative is normal numbers based, qualitative more words based. I'll leave you with prof. Oh, I, I got one more to go, right? Sorry, I forgot that. Okay, all right. So I've already touched on that. Um, I, I, I think in terms of uh, the, the top end of it, others oh, conceptual on the previous slide. So in terms of the bottom part, in terms of method, qualitative data is collected through participant observation. I once had a group of researchers um, who decided, so a group of undergraduates who were doing a research project, and they decided, unbeknownst to the lecturer concern, to follow this, uh, one of my colleagues in Method at Monash University in Australia, to follow her around watching her shopping behavior. Not entirely ethical, it should have been reported, but, but, but that's, it can be for observation. Um, there are also observation rooms. You can, you can actually look through glass, or these days, uh, uh, video cameras and watch people's behavior. Uh, whereas, um, and, and data is analyzed by themes or descriptions. There's some software called InVivo, which maybe um, you may be familiar with, um, and generally reported in terms of the language of the informant and mostly in words, but not entirely in words. Um, quantitative data is collected through measuring things. So it normally involves numbers, and the data is analyzed through numerical comparisons and statistical inferences. Um, all right. Um, and they're typically reported in tables and graphs and so on. And I know that Profic is going to touch upon that. That completes my section. So back to Profic. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Brian, uh, for giving us the, the, uh, the philosophical part of this, which is the most difficult part for me. So thank you for, for taking that section. So now I will zoom through to you on uh, the details about quantitative and qualitative uh, research method. There's a lot for me to cover today, but a lot of information in the slide, but I'm just going to go through it at the surface level. You will get access to the slide, so don't worry if you think that there's so much I'm doing today and a lot to cover within, this, uh, the, within the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, so quantitative method, uh, uh, as, uh, as what uh, Prof. Ryan mentioned as well, uh, is emphasizes on objective measurement and numerical analysis of data uh, collected uh, through polls, through questionnaire, or through surveys. So quantitative research uh, focuses on, on gathering numerical data and generalizing it across okay, the different groups of people. So at the end of the day, you are able to generalize the information compared to qualitative, which I will I will talk about uh, at the second part of the presentation today. Uh, 
So let's look at some of the goals of quantitative research. So in quantitative research, uh, your goal is uh, to actually look at the relationship, okay, between one thing, which is the independent variable, and another, the dependent variable, and how is it related uh, in a close uh, population. So quantitative research designs are either descriptive, okay, where you are, when you do a quantitative research, basically you are actually measuring once, okay? If you're doing a survey, the probability of measuring the same respondent twice is, is, is very negligible. Most of the time you will only measure it once. And all quantitative research can also be very experimental for those in the sciences, okay? Where you do a certain treatment and you see the before and after treatment and then you study. So that is also part of quantitative research. So a descriptive study uh, establishes uh, only association between variables, okay? Whereas an experimental uh, research that you do establishes what we call a causality, cause and effect. You want to study the cause, give certain treatment and see what is the effect. So quantitative research deals in numbers, as what Prof mentioned just now, Brian mentioned, deals in numbers, logic, uh, is very objective, is, uh, uh, it, it uses... Uh, uh, reasoning, a converging reasoning, rather than uh, 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 trying to make an assumption, okay, like the in, in qualitative uh, uh, research. So let's look at some of the characteristic of this quantitative research. Okay, the data is usually gathered using more structured research instruments. Uh, the results are based on large sample sizes. Uh, that is supposed to be a good representation of the population meaning to say your sampling becomes important. If you have a wrong way of doing sampling, then the finding is not a representation of the actual population. The research study can usually be uh, replicated and repeated or given, uh, uh, given its high reliability. So if it's not reliable in the sampling approach, then it is not your study will not be able to be replicated or repeated. Researchers uh, has a clearly defined research question to which uh, objective answers are sought after for the study. So all aspects of the study are carefully designed before data is actually uh, collected. Data are uh, uh, in the form of numbers. It can be in the form of statistics. Okay, the statistics can be there's so many different types of statistics or graphs that you can use, which I will discuss later as well. Project can also be used to generalize concept more widely. Uh, it is able to predict future. You can do forecasting. You are able to investigate the, the causal relationship, the, the cause and effect that I mentioned to you in, in experimental data. Researchers also can use tools to, to, to carry out a certain analysis okay, for the questionnaire. So there's a lot of uh, uh, statistical application that you can actually use. Of course, the most common one that we use is SPSS. There's also SARS, and there's so many others that you can also use. So the overarching aim of, of quantitative uh, research study is to classify the features, to count them, you know, the frequency, and then see the inferential statistics. And then you make an observation to see whether it has supported a particular hypothesis or not. So that is the main way of you structuring a, a quantitative research. Uh, so basic research design for, for any quantitative uh, studies if you see you have to decide whether it will be descriptive or experimental uh, before you start so is this an, a descriptive type of research or is it actually experiment based before you decide how you want to gather the data and analyze and then also to interpret so if you look at the descriptive study subjects are generally measured once uh, the intention is to only establish uh, association between the variables Okay, uh, the dependent variable versus the, the independent variable. And then the study may also include uh, a sample population of hundreds or thousands subjects to ensure that uh, a valid uh, estimate or generalized relationship between the variables can be obtained. So that is why you have to be careful how you do the sampling. An experimental de uh, design is slightly different because the subject is measured the because you want to see the cause and effect. So before and after effect, and then you, you do a test based on the treatment. So the sample population may be small uh, and purposefully uh, chosen, but it is intended to actually 
to understand or to establish the causality between this variable, okay, the cause and effect that I mentioned to you. So usually, when you write a quantitative study section of your publication, whether it's a thesis, whether it's a book chapter, or whether it's a whether it's a journal article, you always write it from a third person point of view, okay. In, in most quantitative research. in qualitative you see uh, it's slightly different but in quantitative you always write as a third person point when you write you don't use the word i i saw this i did this or we have done this you don't use those, those kind of words but you tend to use it as a third person so if you see uh, firstly what is important here is you need to identify the research problem so this we have discussed in the last few sections as well the research problem is important even for the methodology section so uh, with any academic study, you must st state clearly and concisely uh, the research problem that is being investigated. Because if your methodology do not support the research problem that you're trying to investigate, then the method is useless. So you have to understand first, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Secondly, review the literature. Review uh, scholarship on the topics that you're trying to investigate. Synthesize the key themes and if necessary, uh, uh, note down what are the method of inquiry or analysis that is being used by other studies, similar studies. So that will help you to decide okay, what is the gap, uh, whether a particular methodology has been used in the past. So that is a gap that you're trying to fill. If you're going to be replicating exactly the same study, then you're not contributing to the knowledge. Describe the theoretical framework, provide an outline of the uh, theory or hypothesis that is underpinning your study. So if necessary, define uh, unfamiliar or complex terms uh, or concepts or ideas uh, that can uh, provide you the background information of what the study is all about. Because if this is not clearly defined, then you may end up using a wrong methodology. So what are the main uh, methodology section of a quantitative study that you should actually include? So when you do a, a method, these are the, some of the areas that you have to always put in. Number one, you should describe how uh, each objective of the study will be achieved. If your study got three objectives, whether the methodology that you are proposing is going to answer the three, three objectives. So you have to be very clear. So this. Objective one is actually going to be addressed using this particular. So you, you may have quantitative and qualitative uh, approach being done at the same time. It's a mixed method that you use. Uh, but as long as you are able to achieve the objective, then you're fine. So that is important. Number two, provide sufficient details to enable uh, the reader to make an informed uh, assessment of the method being used to obtain the results associated with the research problem. So you have to provide sufficient detail or else the reader will not understand. Thirdly, the population and sampling. So this is critical because if you're doing a quantitative research, you want to ensure that your finding can be generalized. So where did the data come from? How robust uh, is it? Uh, note where a uh, gap exists, if there is, and what was excluded. Okay, if you're using a certain method, is there a gap? or you have disregarded certain data, then explain. So note also the procedure used for their selection. How was the sampling done? Okay, is it prob prob uh, problematic uh, sampling or non-problematic sampling? So how did you actually do? You have to be very, very clear. Data collection. Uh, describe the tools uh, and method that you use to collect information and identify the variables being measured. So describe the method uh, used uh, to obtain the data that you want to select. So note if the data was uh, pre-existing, meaning to say you use a secondary data, let's say census data, some industry data, government data, uh, especially when you're doing a business uh, research, or you gathered it yourself, primary data based on interview. So if you gathered it, describe uh, what kind of instrument you use, okay? Is it... Uh, a tested survey instrument or you created the instrument. If you created the instrument, is it reliable? Have you done a reliability test to see whether the scale that you have used is consistent and is, is uh, reliable? If it's not, then you have to adjust it accordingly. 
And then, of course, data analysis. Describe the procedures uh, for processing and analyzing the data. So if appropriate, you need to describe the specific instrument of analysis used to, to study uh, each of the data that's being uh, studied here. So whether the analysis basically, at the end of the day, help you to answer your research question. So the results section of the quantitative study, also you need to remember that the findings of the study should be written uh, objectively and in a very, uh, very precise uh, format, okay? So it is common then to use a lot of graphs, a lot of tables, charts, and, and other non-textual elements to help out in comparison to qualitative research. So make sure if you're using any non-textual elements, it is not isolated from the text. Okay, when you have a graph, make sure the description of that particular element that you're using, let's say a table or chart, is close by where you do your explanation. Um, so, so statistical analysis, if you see, uh, uh, so this part is also important. How did you analyze your data? What were the key findings from the data? The findings should be present in a logical and sequential order. Okay, so don't just jumble up the whole thing. Follow. You can start with the descriptive uh, finding. Descriptive uh, in terms of the demographic information. Normally, you start the demographic and then you go step by step to analyze. Describe, but uh, do not interpret this data because remember you, uh, you are when you when you start writing later, the, the actual interpretation of the finding will actually come in the discussion. So, so when you are writing your method, of course, you don't put your your findings uh, here, but at the statistical analysis part, what basically you're doing, you're just explaining the methodology, how is it going to be done? So don't put in too much of detail. The detail will actually appear later uh, in your, your other section. And remember, uh, it is also written uh, in a, and, and presented uh, in, the, in the past tense because the study has been conducted and you're actually explaining it in a, in a past tense. General practices in, in reporting uh, quantitative data uh, include only uh, selected information and or images if you're using figures to help uh, clarify certain points. Because when you do quantitative set, uh, studies, especially if you're using SPSS or any uh, sensor analysis, you'll get a lot of data. You don't expect to take everything and dump it in the research. Be selective what information that you require. So a lot of the information that is produced by SPSS is of no use. You just want certain important data that comes out of it. So you need to know what information you need. So extensive tables uh, should be should usually appear as appendices if you need to. If there are certain detail uh, analysis that you you think is very critical, then you include in the appendix, not in your actual uh, writing, uh, in your actual paper. Tables are better than graphs uh, for giving uh, structured. Uh, numerical information compared to graphs. Graphs is useful if you are going to be showing trends, uh, forecasting, comparison. You're going to uh, you want to see the difference or show the relationship. Then it's, it's good to use a graph. But for tables, it's more for very structured type of information. Text alone should not be used to convey uh, more than three or four numbers. So, so what I'm trying to say here is if you have a lot of numbers that you need to explain. And then if you see there's more than three numbers you're, you're explaining in a text, then you know that, okay, looks like I have to show, put it in a table, put it in a numeric, in, arrange it in such a way that people can be, can see. the presentation is done using a table or figure or graph or any images, not just explaining the text, okay? Because in a qual research, it's different. You can do that. So when whole numbers are given in text, okay? So, so if you're using numbers to explain, Numbers less than or equal to nine, you always write in word. Okay, you write if, if you're using, let's say, if in the methodology you're explaining, uh, the same also goes when you are you're writing the, the result section. If you say the word one, don't put the number one, you write O and E. If two, two W O. Anything less than nine, you write in word. Anything more than nine, then from 10 onwards, then you put it in digit. So that is another thing that you have to take note of. When you're using decimal numbers, okay, uh, number, make sure you check the consistency of your digit. If you think you're going to report in one decimal, maintain one. If two decimal, 
maintain two. So this is also important. Tables and graphs should be self-explanatory. What basically it means is, if you need to use table and graph, make sure that the table and graph is really needed. And when, when anyone reads your table and graph, they understand, okay, what it means. Okay, so if a table does not warrant any discussion, it means what? It means to say that table is not needed. Okay, so don't just use a table or figure for the sake of using it. Statistical information uh, beyond means and frequency, if you're using means and frequency, is usually required in more scientific paper, but may not be necessary if you're doing a very, for general readership. Okay, for general readership, yes, uh, general uh, frequency and means is quite good, but if you're doing more in-depth publication, then you need more uh, different kind of analysis. So you have to describe that in your methodology. Okay, so next part is I'm talking about more of, uh, although it is not part of a, a methodology section, but I thought it's still good for me to, to, to explain to you because uh, it is uh, related in a way to method, the, the way how you present a certain non-textual element uh, in, your, in your writing, okay? So I'm going to go quickly here because there's a few charts here. Uh, you can look at it when you get the time. Uh, it gives you more details information of how to present pie chart, okay? How to use a uh, pie chart. Uh, when do you use uh, uh, a, uh, a chart like this to, to represent certain data that you have? So pie chart is a common one that, that we always use. And then there are also pie chart that is used when you have different sets of data. Okay, how to use a combination of different pie chart. So, so you please read through this. I'm not going to uh, spend time on this. How to use multiple pie chart uh, or how, how to use a pie chart compared to a bar chart, okay? A bar chart, uh, whether it's good to use one bar chart rather than having so many multiple pie chart to actually uh, talk about the same information. If you look at the, the, the diagram that you see on the screen now, the two pie chart is actually speaking to you on the same data, which is shown in the bar chart. So if you see from this diagram, the bar chart is a better representation because it shows the comparison. Whereas for the, if you use a pie chart to, to discuss the same data between 2006 and 2007, you're not able to make a comparison. You, you have to see the figures and say, okay, 25% versus 27, okay, 27% is much higher. So you have to see one by one, but when you look at the bar chart immediately, you can see, okay, uh, what is the difference between the survey respondent in 206 versus 207? So, so that's why you have to choose the correct graph. The same thing goes uh, for bar charts, bar graph. How do you arrange the data? How do you sort the data? If you see the first diagram versus the second diagram, one is sorted, okay? One is unsorted. When it's unsorted, if you see it's a long shot, long shot. And then once it's sorted, then you see, okay, it is increasing. So when you do your analysis, it will become easy as well. And then similar to the pie chart, so there is also different ways of showing the chart. You can stack a bar graph or you can compare it. If you look at the first one, it is so difficult to actually uh, see the difference when you stack it up. So whereas the second one, you can actually see the high and low. Even if you, if you don't put the percentage, you can immediately see. Whereas the first one, it is difficult because you have to estimate, okay, which is bigger, the red one or the yellow one? Is the yellow bigger than the orange? It's so difficult to see. Whereas in the second chart, immediately you know which is the right one, which is, which is doing well and which is, which is much lower. And then, of course, you also have another common chart that is used is a line chart. Okay, line graph is normally used to display uh, time series uh, data. The time series data where you want to baseline on certain timeline, okay, whether it's month and weeks or year, then it's good to use uh, a line chart because it's continuous. The data are all continuous. So this is another thing that you can use. And again, the way how you use the, the, the different lines to represent different colors. But if you have so many lines, then it is also of no use because it becomes too confusing. So you need to ensure that the correct number of lines. So normally four to five lines uh, is fine, but anything more than that, sometimes it can get very uh, messy. And then of course, there is also a way, sometimes you want to use uh, uh, tables. Tables are the most effective way uh, to present data for, for reference purposes. A table, uh, 
should always be given in a meaningful and self-explanatory title. One look at the table, I see the title, I should know what is in the table. So each part of a table should be labeled clearly. Okay, and do not use abbreviation in tables because it can confuse if the abbreviation is not very common. So the number of digits and decimal, as I've said also earlier, should be consistent. Okay, should be consistent the way how you present it. So it is usually uh, better to convert counts uh, into percentage. Okay, if you are doing uh, counts, okay, your frequency analysis, it's best to use uh, percentage rather than the count. Okay, because percentage gives you a big, bigger understanding uh, uh, in comparison to the total respondent size because your respondent size is tied to your population because that's how you did your sampling. So if you if you just based on count, it doesn't really show you exactly whether is, this, is, is it a majority or is it a minority. So the number doesn't make sense unless you put it into a uh, percentage. Okay, so it is best to present information in an order that makes sense to the reader, okay, by sorting them, as I've said earlier. So, so table use is, is useful the way how you present it. So if you look at the table in the screen here, the one at the top versus the one at the bottom is the same data actually, but it's presented in a different way. Okay, if you see the top, the heading, they have put the 2009 together, they put the 2008 together. So it's the same data actually, just the presentation. So you have to find the best presentation that makes sense for your data. So the, the discussion uh, section for any quantitative study should be analytical, logical, and comprehensive, okay? So you want to interpret the result uh, based on baselining with the research problem. So don't just interpret, because sometimes when you do analysis, you realize that, hey, I got so much of data from the method that I've chosen. A lot of data has come, but all this data may be irrelevant to answer your research question. So always be careful what data you're trying to answer. Sometimes you get more than what you want. So description of trends, uh, comparison of groups or relationships among the variables must be highlighted uh, in the study. So you don't have to highlight every single data when you do your analysis later, which we will discuss more on the chapter on, on results and discussion uh, in our next few session. Uh, so the, and the implication of your results, how does this answer the research question and the gaps in the study. Of course, at the end of the day, you must also talk about your limitation of collecting this data. Is there a problem in the data collected? Is it very biased? If it's biased, explain. If you think that, no, I think that my sample, my respondent cannot understand English, so they struggle to answer the question. So there can be a limitation as well. So you have to be clear. So the end of, this, of your study, uh, what is important is for you to summarize the key findings, recommendation, and what is the future research going about. So remember, this is, although I know this is part of your results section, but since we're talking about method, I want to a bit highlight on this, uh, on the quantitative study area. Uh, okay, let me go straight to the next one, uh, qual. So qualitative research method is slightly different uh, because remember, qual method uh, may be defined as uh, as trying to trying to find an answer to that why question, okay? So, so if you look here, uh, so a lot of researchers, uh, qualitative researchers uh, want to go more in depth on the numbers. So normally in most cases, uh, when you're doing a mixed method study, they tend to start with the qualitative research first, get the why question, and then take the why question and then break it down into a quantitative study to see your data that is going to support the why that you came out. Remember that in, in a qualitative research, what you are doing is, uh, is you are trying to prove the theory that you have with you. Uh, you're trying to create the theory. Whereas in a quantitative research, what you're doing is you are trying to test the theory to see whether it is correct or not. So that's why you always do hypothesis testing in quantitative study, whereas in qual study, it's not. It's the other way around. You're creating the, the actual uh, uh, theory here. So if we see uh, there are different kinds of design for qualitative research. 
naturalistic studies meaning uh, that people bring to situation phenomena. Uh, what you're trying to do is this is based on what you see uh, appearing uh, in, in your field of study. Uh, and then you go in depth to understand what is the phenomena that is creating that. So that's why for in depth, for research, qualitative research, you are actually spending a lot of time with the, with the respondent. Uh, it can be a small respondent side, but you spend a lot of a long period of time to actually understand what is the phenomenon that's making the change in that particular state. That's why they always say it's very in-depth. It's very tough because it's in-depth. It's tougher. People may think that a qual study is much easier than quant. It's not. Qual study is actually more difficult to do. Uh, and then you look at emergent here. What do you mean emergent? is the flexibility or, or to change certain things. So the researcher is not very rigid compared to a compared to a, a quantitative study where it's very rigid. Once you set a design, you follow rigidly the way how you do. Whereas in, in quant study, there's a lot of flexibility based on what you see in the field and then you and, and what is the analysis that you come up with. But the only challenge, of course, in qual research is it's always difficult to uh, generalize your finding because one researcher, or one respondent to another may change accordingly. So it's very difficult to generalize compared to a quantitative uh, research. Purposeful, uh, the sample consists of the, the actual purpose of why you're doing your study. So if you think that you want to study on uh, the organizational behavior, then you, you do a purposeful sampling to that organization only. Okay, and then you select the data by interviewing the people that to understand the behavior. So it's very purposeful in the way how you do sampling. You don't do a, a wide uh, sampling where you just pick someone in the random and then do a survey, a qualitative survey. Qualitative survey must be done very purposefully. So data collected uh, yield detail of, of the information that you want to, to collect here. So this thick description of the information, the why can only be done if you spend a lot of time with the respondent. So this is where you do your interviews, you do based on different case studies to understand. Uh, you have focus group discussion, you do uh, a, a library research, a document review. That is also part of data collection approach for qualitative research. It can also be, remember qualitative research can also be as simple as you're going somewhere to a field and then doing, an, doing a field observation of what is happening and then logging and then talking to some people and then start logging. That is also part of the personal experience, also part of qualitative research. Okay, so there are so many ways uh, you can actually do a, a qualitative research, but what is important is you're trying to be neutral in the way how you collect the data. You are very open. You don't push the biasness that you have on certain topic to the researcher. When you interview the researcher, it's also important how you do it. And then the dynamic here is the research is very flexible, okay? You may have planned to do step one, step two, step three, but when you go to the field sometime, the method that you have adopted will change. So when you write your methodology for qualitative research, it must be flexible enough to change according to the situation uh, uh, on the ground. So there's different types of data analysis, uh, uh, qualitative approach that you can do. There's content analysis, uh, based on contents that you've collected, okay, it can be secondary data, it can be narrative analysis, okay, you do some interviews, then you start, uh, you, you start uh, recording it and then understanding what is the problem all about as you do uh, uh, analysis. Uh, there's also discourse analysis uh, where you, you start talking and, 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 and look, at, look at the written information that's already there and then try to analyze the written information. Uh, there's also something called the framework analysis. Uh, this is uh, using a different thematic uh, framework and coding, especially when you are using application like NVivo, which uh, Prof. Ryan uh, discussed just now. Then you start coding it accordingly and use the code and map it accordingly and see is there a pattern that is appearing. And then, of course, there's also the, the most... Uh, uh, common uh, qual research is the, the grounded theory where this method of uh, qualitative data analysis starts with an analysis of a, a single case to formulate a particular theory. Then you start adding a lot of information as you start uh, going to the ground. So normally you start with zero. You don't go with a, 
a preconceived idea of what to expect and you're collecting the data as you speak in the ground. So that's why it's grounded theory here. So major components of uh, qualitative uh, research design uh, is almost uh, the same as the quant. You always start with the goal. Uh, you have a framework of how the, the qualitative research design is going to be done. And then you talk about uh, the research question that you're trying to, to, to understand. And then you design the method and then talk about the validity. How do you ensure the validity of your data? Because remember for qual research, uh, it is not based on how many respondents that you have. Uh, it is not number game. Okay, it is more on the quality of data that you have. So how well, how do you ensure that the respondent is valid for you? So the validity aspect becomes key. And then conclusion, how do you formally conclude your study? So of course, there's a lot of strength in using qualitative method because it's in depth. It gives you great details. Uh, it's very fluid. You can change accordingly, unlike uh, Quan. Once you set the survey questionnaire, you cannot change halfway. You have to maintain. Whereas in Qual, you can change accordingly. Uh, it can be based on experience. It can be based on observation. Uh, it looks at uh, uh, data that it, uh, that, it, that you, you can change the, the line of uh, questioning when you design any question and then change it accordingly. Very open-ended. So it is able to capture a lot more detailed information uh, compared to uh, quant research. But of course, because it is so open, there's also a lot of limitation. Very subjective. Okay, it's not an objective approach. Very uh, data rigidity. Although it is not rigid in that sense, but the problem is because it is so subjective, the validity becomes difficult for you. Okay, so that is why a lot of qual research is also sometimes uh, strengthened by also put, doing a few uh, quantitative uh, research uh, inside. Um, it can be time consuming qual, for qual research because you have to interview, you have to transcribe, the whole process is very slow. Uh, not all journals will accept qual. Similarly, not all qual research will be accepted in quant journal and not all quant journal, a quant kind of research can be published in a qual research. Uh, uh, journals. So they have their place. Researchers influence something can negatively impact collected data. Let's say if you're interviewing and then you put your biases in the interview, it can impact your findings. So you cannot replicate. As I've said, it's not generalizable. Your sample is small, okay, because it is normally uh, sample size is based on, on uh, whether you have reached uh, what you call a theoretical saturation point, meaning to say, I've talked to four or five Respondent, and now the five respondents seem to be giving the same information. Then you know you have reached a saturation point. So that's not, it's not a number game. Uh, trust needed between the, the researcher and subject. If the, the subject, your respondent, is scared to talk to you or do not want to reveal the actual information, then you don't get the correct information. So you have to build a good relationship with the respondent. Uh, researchers, knowledge, and skill is important how you maneuver the whole uh, interview. So at the end of the day, uh, to conclude, what is important is uh, when you do uh, any of this research method, whether it's quant or qual, uh, there must be some form of ethics. So in many institutions, they do have this ethics committee, or in some institutions, they call it an IRB or Institutional Review Board to ensure that the, the question, the survey, the interview that you're doing is ethically accepted, okay? You're not asking some difficult or some uh, confidential information. So that becomes important before a research uh, can be uh, carried out. And then the credibility to ensure that uh, your interpretation of the information is correct. So whether you have done it correctly, okay, from the respondent that you get, and then auditability, whether you're able to provide proof if someone say, hey, I, I don't agree with your findings, is that data, uh, statistical data to prove that no, I have collected it correctly and this is what. So you must be able to provide the evidence. So this becomes important in any method that you choose. All right, so that is uh, a bit of detail on, on, on quantitative and qualitative and also additional to that, uh, I, I also talk about 
the, the non-textual element, which I thought is also important for me to highlight here. So now uh, just uh, I will hand over to uh, Pyro Nizan to give us a quick uh, overview on the uh, library support in terms of uh, writing a research method. Over to you, uh, Pyro Nizan. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. All right, for today's topic on methodology, I will highlight on research method guides and handbook available in the library's collection and also open access resources. Library has over 500 resources such as ebooks, plain books, reference work, journal articles which provide information about research method and design. These resources can help provide context for writing a research question, choosing a research method, collecting and analyzing data used in numerous disciplines. Uh, WOU Visited Digital Library has various titles of research methodology. Using the EBSCO eBooks Business with Academic Database as an example on the screen, you will be able to find eBooks on research methodology, research design, or specific research methods, either qualitative or quantitative. Next, please. Okay, there are also a number of research method books for different disciplines in WOU District Library Collection in print format, as displayed on the screen. So you can search the online catalog to check on available titles in both libraries. Next. Okay, on the screen, I've, I've listed uh, ebooks with hyperlinks for District and WOU user. You can access it and read the books. We, uh, you can just log in to the digital library using the username and password provided to you. Okay, there are, we have two more ebooks on research methodology that you can also access from the Expo host database by the WU District Digital Library. Next. Okay, these are electronic full text of books on research methodology. So you just click on the link on the hyperlink to read further on the books that we have displayed on the list. Okay, next. Okay, as the final slide, this is the list of online resources for further reading on methodology. So thank you, and I pass the session back to Prabhu. Thank you, uh, Faru Nizan. Uh, so that's all for the session today. Uh, I know there's a lot of information today. Uh, it's a bit more technical, a little more confusing for some of you. Um, the information is available. Uh, we will ensure that you get uh, the slides. So, so if anyone, you would want to get the back slides uh, that you missed before, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, we will have we have all the recordings, all the presentation slides because in all the slides there are also a lot of links, especially uh, on the library support. So all these hyperlinks. The ebooks are is all in the slide, so you can actually click on it and then access the information. Uh, so there's a lot of info out there. Uh, so what we have given is just a quick summary of uh, uh, the info that can help you to to start off your your writing. So if if there's any question, uh, I shall open the floor. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat. Uh, we're just four four minutes past the time. Uh, is there any question from anyone who is struggling uh, in their methodology, uh, struggling to decide which method to use, struggling on the, the analysis part, struggling sometimes in the SPSS usage, uh, um, you know, what kind of uh, analysis to do. Uh, there are a lot of, I, I'm not a statistics expert, but then we have a lot of uh, experts who can help you in uh, especially uh, if you are doing your graduate studies, uh, postgraduate studies, then uh, it becomes so important. So any, any question from anybody? No question. Okay. All right, so there's no question either. You're all very confused today because it's a bit more technical or you, you quite understand uh, uh, maybe what we have discussed is, is uh, very fundamental for, for some of you. Uh, but don't forget the, the resources that we have provided you will really help you, especially for those of you who need more in-depth on qual research and quantitative and the philosophy. There's a lot of uh, resources that we have provided you at the end just now. So please do not hesitate to contact us. 
Okay, so if there's no question, thank you once again. We will see you again in two weeks' time. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.